afternoon, good evening, wherever. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, wherever you may be. My name is Chido Anuma, and I warmly welcome you to the 2021 Men on Blue Prostate uh, Cancer Awareness with the team is Prostate Cancer Preventable. Uh, this event is being hosted by the Jehovah Grammar School Old Boys Association 02 Club. Today is Saturday, 31st July 2021. Our guest speaker is Dr. Ibuquis Martin C, who is a consultant urologist, renal transplant surgeon at Zenith Medical and Kidney Center, Abuja. And your host is Prince Ademolu A.A., who is the president of Ijebode Grammar School Old Boys Association. Again, my name is Chido Anuman, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Uh, just a quick background before we dive into the event proper. Cancer, we all know, is a major public health problem worldwide. Thousands of persons worldwide are diagnosed with cancer yearly. Half of these people will eventually die from it. According to the 2018 WHO country profile for Nigeria, cancer ranks the second most common cause of death following cardiovascular diseases. Cancer might soon become the number one cause of NCD deaths in Nigeria due to the ongoing and population, all due to the aging and population growth, increasing prevalence of smoking, excessive alcohol consumption, obesity, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity, as well as lifestyle changes. In Nigeria, cancer leads to over 72,000 deaths per annum. 30,924 for male and 40,647 for female. This number is said to increase, meaning that there are 102,000 new cases of cancer every year. The estimated incidence for prostate cancer is 12%, and estimated mortality for prostate cancer is 13%. Prostate cancer is the third leading cancer death in Nigeria and the leading, and, it's, um, and nothing is said about prostate cancer in Nigeria. Every October, virtually all cancer NGOs roll out their drums of awareness focused on breast cancer. Prostate cancer is always missing, while several men die in silence and pain because their prostate cancer were discovered at late stages. To change the above scenario, Project Pink Blue, with funding support from ARC Foundation, launched the Men on Blue intervention in 2018. Uh, through the hashtag Men on Blue, we have reached thousands of men in Abuja, Enugu, Lagos, Nasarawa, Niger, and River States in uh, 2018 and 2019. In partnership with the Jabode Grammar School, Old Boys Association, Zero Two Club. Uh, Project Pink Blue is implementing this Men on Blue Prostate Cancer webinar to create awareness and encouragement to go for screening. The 2021 Men on Blue Cancer Awareness webinar will focus on asking the very bold question, is prostate cancer preventable? This webinar will form a greater part of ongoing conversation in supporting Nigeria's federal ministry of health efforts in achieving the targets of National Cancer Control Plan 2018 to 2022. Uh, the goal, therefore, is to reduce the incidence of prostate cancer through the creation of a platform for prostate cancer awareness, education, screening, and support in Nigeria. The objectives are threefold. One, to raise, to answer the question on is prostate cancer preventable? to raise awareness and share information about prostate cancer, and three, to educate participants on treatment options available for prostate cancer. Uh, dear participants, this is a public event. It will be live on Facebook and on Instagram as well. Uh, we have started streaming on both platforms. There are a few rules, health rules that we need to have to ensure that we have a very smooth program. We encourage all participants to be on mute during 
the speaking session. Uh, we also should take note that this meeting will be recorded and that recording has started. All participants are expected to show their video of a set when they are talking. Uh, we can send messages via chat box if needs, the need arises. Only meeting hosts can permit screen sharing. All speakers who wish to use PowerPoint uh, should please share their PowerPoints. Uh, this meeting will be live again on uh, Facebook and Instagram and YouTube, which has started. Uh, for the presentation, we encourage speakers to use PowerPoint presentation. Please note the event will be recorded and published on, published on YouTube. Uh, the guest speaker will speak for 30 minutes. And in total, the meeting will last for one hour and 30 minutes. And people are free to leave once the conference ends at 5.30 p.m. Uh, so, uh, Without wasting much time, I'd like to call on the host, Prince Ademolu, a, a president of the Jabodi Emma School Host Students Association, for his opening address. Prince Ademolu, please. You have five minutes. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Ademolu Adetokumbo of Club 02, the Jabodi Grammar School Boy Association. Well, our school is one of the oldest and prestigious school in Nigeria. Founded 20th January, 1913. Our school has produced numerous um, great Nigerian sons. The likes of Sir Mobolaji Bakantoni, a foremost industrialist, Chief Adiola Dutola, Yogbenoja of Ijebuland, Pa Ibrahim Adesonya, the foremost um, Democrat and ADECO member, Justice Inumi Dungakonde, former Chief Justice of Lagos, Dr. Lauren Nibe Mamora, the Minister of Health, current Serving Minister of Health for State. Our great school prides itself with numerous achievements, with strong fraternity, fra affinity towards Old Boys Association, and that's caught across the world with strong fraternity among the brotherhood. If you permit me to share the slide here, I think I said it, can I share? Just give Hello? me one minute, give me one okay. minute and I'll give you the opportunity to share. Okay, I think I sent it to Miss um, Madam Banj, um, Kadijat Banwu, she has it. Yeah, I think you can share now, please. Okay. Sorry, just a minute. Uh, uh, um, sorry, uh, can I send it to you so you can share? Okay, sure. Should I? Okay, sense. You can check the chat box right now. It's available there. I'm downloading it. You can go on, sir. Okay. Um, so, how school? One of the most formal school. Yes. S slide two. Two, the, the next one. So, our school, one of the oldest and uh, prestigious school in, in Nigeria, founded 20th of January, 1913. 
We've produced the likes of Mbolaji Bankantoni, Chief Adiola Odutola, Abraham Adesanya Justice, Inu Midu Akonde, the, the former Chief Justice of Lagos, and the current serving State Minister of Health. Okay, the school anthem. Next, sir. Next. Next. So for our members uh, online, I would love you guys to join me in sharing the school anthem. We pride this song so much. Every time we go out there to, 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 to events, we, we pride ourselves in singing this anthem. But I would like to, because of the time available to me, I would like to jump to the fourth verse. So it goes like this. The comrades shout with my and faith was true. We pledge we to all a self above our dad who divine. No, 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 there's no reason. I just shout with my time favors true. Do, 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 do. We pray to all ourselves for a above our hands and head and heart to all. Do, 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 do. Bye. No, 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 be be no, 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 so the next slide. The, the current leadership of the club deemed the fit to seek better cooperation with knowledge-based NGO to further help, help in giving help socks that relate to middle-aged men as we grow older. The search led us to partner with Project Pink Blue Organization. I have seen their great works across Nigeria and their passion to help millions of Nigerians overcome cancer-related ailments in likes of hepatitis advocacy, breast cancer advocacy, oncology fundraising, cancer therapy. We hope to always continue to partner with Project Pink Blue in the nearest future. Because our school, our school, um, it's only male dominated, it's male dominated school, male only in local language. So we are all boys. I haven't left the school over 20, 20, 21, 20 years, almost 20 years now. We feel while growing, we need to be conscious of our environment and conscious of the happenings around, all, around us. So we didn't fit to, to partner with Project Pink Blue organization to, to raise the awareness of cancers in men. Because while growing up, we all have different form of habits or social lifestyle. And in my wisdom, I feel young male people should be abreast of what is happening around them in terms of health related matters. So we, we feel partnering with Project Pink Blue would go in, um, in a long way to help raise awareness on cancer-related issues in men, especially. And, um, sorry, back. Yes. Back. But yes. We, we found out that having studied or briefly researched about cancer, prostate cancer itself, and early detection in Nigerian men. Re research has shown that prostate cancer has become the number one cancer killer in Nigerian men and constitutes 11% of all male cancers. The median age of patients was around 67, 67 to 71 years old. So in my own conclusion, I feel prostate cancer incidents and the magnitude of this risk in our population may have been grossly misunderstood under underestimated the clinical post cancer in Nigeria in Nigeria may be great as that's noted in the black men in the United States which 
may suggest a common enhancing genetic predisposition. And I'm sure Mr. Dr. Chido, pardon my language, sir. Dr. Chido can attest to this that prostate cancer is a major killer in Nigeria. Um, while trying to conclude and give thanks to give a vote of thanks, I would love to say a big shout out to the organizers, especially the executive director, Mr. Rose Chidibe, for his um, um, for his commitment in making this webinar come to reality, and also to the project supervisor, Madam, I call her Madam. Ban Wokadijat, the project advisor for the back and forth email exchange for trying to moderate and see where we can give and take. And to all stars of projects Pink Blue, I say a big, a big, big, big thank you to you all. For some I've not met, I say a big thank you to you. Once I'm in Abuja, I will find time to come to your office and say a big thank you to all the staff and in particular the executive director, Mr. Rose Chibi B. And uh, I want to also use this medium to say a big thank you to every participant on this show. I know it's, I know this web, web, webinar will be an high opener to the major mites and funny stories we have all heard about post trait cancers in men across the world. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, uh, Prince. Thank you to the club. Way to club for your support for this process. It means a lot uh, to Project Pink Blue, and we hope you continue the partnership. I uh, will now call on the executive director of Project Pink Blue to quickly give us uh, his welcome address. Mr. Francis C. W. Chidebe is executive director of Pink Blue. The floor, you have the floor, Rossi. Okay, thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Chido Onuma. I know many people are not aware, but Dr. Chido is actually joining us all the way from, you know, Toronto, Canada. I'm sure you all will understand the time difference and the huge sacrifice he has actually made to really moderate this very important session. My name is Ron C. W. Chidebe. I'm the executive director of Project Pink Blue. I'm really excited about this kind of partnership because um, the more we are able to continue to leverage different platforms to reach out to different men, the more we are able to reduce the incidence and burden of, of prostate cancer. I will use this opportunity to sort of, um, you know, provide a little background about Project Pink Blue and what we do. Project Pink Blue, you know, has been engaged in creating awareness and helping you know, people impacted with cancer in different initiatives. Um, every year we organize the World Cancer Day Walk. We organize the Pink October Walk in Lagos. And most of this work usually bring over 3,000 to 5,000 people to walk on the streets of Abuja and Lagos to create awareness. In 2015, Project Pink Blue launched the first patient navigation program with the support from Union for International Cancer Control. And this program at the moment has actually spread to over seven states across the country. And in 2017, we've partnered um, you know, with the wife of the vice president to provide screening to thousands of women in Lagos. Uh, we also founded the first cancer support group in Abuja with just nine patients at the moment to have over 98. And in 2018, we've asked ourselves this question, right? We've all been doing a lot of work, especially around breast cancer, cervical cancer, but very little about prostate cancer. And we've had this thing that men are too strong, you know, but to be honest, data has shown that about 15 men actually die every single day from prostate cancer. It's a very serious issue, but many cases we don't really pay attention to it. So we're so grateful for uh, ACT Foundation that provided the first funding that we used to you know, implement this project. And with that project, we provided screening for about 1,661 men in different communities in Lagos, in Abuja, in Enugu, in Portakot, in Niger, in Nasarawa, and, and River State. So we're really delighted about this partnership because this partnership has shown that 
men are beginning to see that cancer is a disease that uh, affects everyone, including men and women and children as well. So Project Pink Blue, we're super, super delighted about this partnership. And we hope that this partnership will continue. Uh, we hope to do more projects with you, with your team and your organization. We hope for you to also leverage this um, you know, program as well to reach out to other men across, uh, across your network. Um, I will stop here, uh, but I will also want to thank every one of you for joining. Uh, we will be so delighted to know where you're joining from. And if you can use the chat box to sort of introduce yourself, tell us who you are, your name, and just drop it on the chat box. We will know who you are and where you're joining us from. And we'll celebrate you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction, uh, um, The next item on the agenda is the reason we are here today, which is to have a conversation around prostate cancer. And the theme for today's conversation is, is, pro, uh, is prostate cancer preventable? And the person to do justice to this topic is uh, Dr. Ibokwe Martin C., who is a consultant urologist, renal transplant surgeon at Zenith Medical and Kidney Center in Abuja. Uh, Dr. Ibokwe will speak for 30 minutes. It's uh, 4 20 within the clock on the system, which is set on the Nigerian time, is 4.25 p.m. You have 30 minutes to make your presentation. After the presentation, it will be followed by questions and answers. So if you have any questions, please note them, and you can put them in the chat box because we have very limited time for questions. Put your questions out, read them out, then uh, once Dr. Mbukwe is done with his presentation, we'll, we'll take that and continue with the program. Uh, Dr. Mbukwe Martin C, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Chido. Uh, thank you, Rossi. Good afternoon, ladies, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I hope, I hope you can hear me and I hope you can see my slides. Good afternoon, we can hear you loud and clear, sir. All right, sir. So um, today, my name is Dr. Ibukwe Martin. Uh, I'm a urologist and I've been um, assigned to do justice to the topic, is prostate cancer preventable? So I'll you know, go through this in the next uh, half an hour. Uh, I would like to acknowledge um, Project Pink Blue for this opportunity. Um, also the Jebode Grammar School Old Boys Association of the O2 Club and my beautiful family for all the support during the preparation of this presentation. Um, so as a form of introduction, uh, I'll go through the presentation using this outline. You can see uh, prevention is highlighted. So Ronsi, I put prevention as part of the last component because this is the main meat of the discussion. So I want to dwell a lot on it after I've given the background on prostate cancer. So prostate cancer is a cancer that affects the prostate gland in men. Uh, I'm going to show a picture that shows what the prostate gland looks like and where it's located in men. Um, is the commonest urological malignancy worldwide um, and accounts for 80% of urological malignancies, um, according to a study by myself, um, done among uh, Southwestern men in Ileife. Worldwide, it's um, the fourth most commonly diagnosed cancer behind breast, lung, and colon. This is as, as, as at last year in the Global Count 2020, with an incidence of over 7.3%. Um, it's noted that in men, you know, prostate cancer is almost as common as lung cancer. In, in the past, lung cancer used to be so common. Prostate cancer is catching up. This is an eye opener that we need to do something. Um, you can see that on the pie chart there, 14.1% of cancer in men. And as uh, Dr. Chido has already said, about 72,000 deaths per annum, about 15 men die per day. And we must know that prostate cancer is more severe among men of African descent. So in African-American men, in Nigeria, men, any black men anywhere, prostate cancer is more common and it's more aggressive among these men. Hence, um, the prostate cancer is the third leading cancer death in Nigeria, but the most common cancer in Nigerian men and the most common cause of cancer-related deaths in Nigerian men. I hope we are following this. 
um, hospital-based studies in Nigeria in, in, in you know, the, the past decade downplayed on the, uh, the number of patients with prostate cancer. You know, because these are people that come to the hospital. So uh, Usebu et al. in Lagos, Bamos et al., my trainer in Ife, uh, saw, you know, um, incidents of about 127, 182, 100,000. But it was until uh, a couple of years ago when Ikura et al. in Lagos went into the community and found over 1,000 per 100,000 100, men had prostate cancer in the community. And the peak age of prostate cancer we know is between 60 and 79 years old. So age is a big factor, you know, is a disease of age. This is what we call it. So the older a man gets, the higher the chances that he will develop prostate cancer. So when we go to the community to check, we are likely to find men with prostate cancer, and we are more likely to find men with early prostate cancer, which is likely to be amenable to treatment. Unlike in our environment where people who have prostate cancer only come to the hospital with advanced disease, metastatic disease or locally advanced disease, at which time we cannot cure them and they eventually die from the disease. So, um, so here I have a, a, an image. I hope you can see this image. Uh, so you're going to see uh, the prostate here. It looks like a walnut located somewhere under the bladder. It's a, it's a sex gland responsible for producing uh, prostatic fluid, which uh, is necessary to nourish sperm and helps for you know, a man to impregnate his wife and have babies. But when a man gets to 40 and above, the prostate begins to enlarge. In certain percentage of men, uh, if you live long enough, there can be cancerous you know, transformation of the prostate gland. So this is something that happens as a man gets older. So the idea is that you, know, you want to prevent this from happening. And when it happens, if you can't help it, you want to detect it early enough to cure it so that you can live as long as possible. What about the cause of prostate cancer? The truth is that the cause of prostate cancer is not known. But what we know is that the presence of androgens, androgens are testosterone, the one that is produced by the testes. What makes us men? What makes us have erections, appear like men, have the baritone voice, have the physique of men? You know, it's produced by the testes. So once a man has his testes, then he has the chance to have prostate cancer. So if you, want, if you don't want to have prostate cancer, then you remove a boy's testes before puberty, then he's never going to have prostate cancer. But of course, nobody will want their testes removed. That is why we are men. All right. So um, the risk factors will include age, as I mentioned. So as a man gets to you know, 60 years and above, he has the higher chances of having prostate cancer. When we see prostate cancer in men 55 and below, these are usually the hereditary forms of prostate cancer which uh, occur, you know, maybe the father had it or the brother had it. So these are usually the more aggressive forms and they don't survive very long. So usually the more common age groups are above 60 uh, years of age. Uh, from my dissertation uh, for both of the colleges, um, the mean age is about 71, 72.5 years uh, in Nigeria. So um, it's a commoner in Blacks than in Caucasians, uh, in Hispanics uh, and in Asians. Um, as I mentioned, there's also a genetic predisposition Certain uh, genetic um, factors like the BRCA gene, uh, the COX-2 gene have been actually identified to you know, you know, be familiar. And this is why certain family members may have a higher risk. There are other things like the diet. It's known that people who consume high amounts of animal proteins in their diet, high amounts of dairy, milk, cheese in their diet, have a higher chance of uh, developing prostate cancer. Um, also diet, um, that is, uh, re, you know, that is poor. People that don't eat a lot of vegetables and fruits, you know, and trace elements, you know, like selenium, zinc, vitamin E, lycopene, vitamin C. These deficiencies could actually uh, be a cause of prostate cancer. Cigarette smoking has, uh, you know, is found to increase the risk of prostate cancer. Obesity, in any form, is uh, also a risk factor for prostate cancer. There are some other you know, risks that are not as clear, like the rule of vasectomies. Um, people are not so sure whether those that have vasectomies have a higher chance of prostate cancer, but this has been shown in one or two studies. Um, also cadmium, which can be gotten from certain uh, chemical you know, text factories, has, is said to have a higher you know, cost when it's in the blood, can cause prostate cancer. There is a controversy about sexual intercourse, um, but what he said is that men who um, have recurrent sexually transmitted infections may have a higher risk of prostate cancer. Uh, while some authorities also believe that men who uh, do not have sex often may also be at risk of prostate cancer. But these are really controversial. So when patients have prostate cancer, how do they present? 
they can present in three modalities. They can present asymptomatic. What this means is that um, this individual doesn't know he has any problem with him. He's actually been evaluated for some other condition or has screening, you know, um, or in the community, does his PSA check or something and detects that the PSA values are higher than what it should be. So usually this is the way you want to detect most patients because when they're asymptomatic, they're usually likely to pick them at a more early stage. And uh, the earlier the stage, the better outcome, you know, for the patient. And what of local advanced disease? This is a disease that is, you know, within the prostate, but hasn't gone far away from the prostate. Uh, so these kind of patients, I will tell you how they can present. And then the way majority of 70 to 80% of patients in Nigeria present, they present with metastasis. This means the prostate cancer has gone beyond the prostate. It has spread to the bones. It has spread to different parts of the body. So definitely this means that the outcome, you know, for such patients will be a lot graver. So how does prostate cancer spread? It can spread directly, you know, uh, to contiguous structures. It can spread hematogenously, which means through the blood, and it can flow to the bones, to the lungs, to any part of the body, and it can, it can go through the lymphatics. It's important to note that apart from the lymph nodes, the commonest place where prostate cancer spreads to is the lumbosacral uh, vertebrae. This is the backbone. This is why we see a lot of men, when they have prostate cancer, the first thing they complain about is low back pain. While it may appear new, but what it, that means is that the cancer has already spread and has affected, you know, the the, the bones or the the, lumb, the lumbar, you know, uh, vertebrae of the back. So um, when you present to the physician, we want to examine from head to toe. After discussing with the patients, we want to examine them from head to toe. You know, some of the patients present very late, so I think they are very sick. You know, they, their blood levels are very low because the cancer has spread to the bone marrow and has affected their blood lines. You know, they can have inability to pass urine, especially when, you know, the prostate is big and it's obstructing the flow of urine. If you saw from that picture, the prostate is at the bladder neck. And uh, if it's enlarged, it can actually obstruct the flow of urine. Um, also, on the musculoskeletal system, they could have fractures of their bones, affectation of the back and the spinal cord compression. They may not be able to walk. They may not be able to control their feces and their urine, things like that. We want to examine their prostate gland. We do this by sticking our finger in the, rect in the anus and feeling the prostate gland. There's a characteristic way that uh, prostate cancer feels. Um, and we're able to feel this in about 33 to 40% of patients. Um, so how do these patients uh, present? So as I mentioned, for those that come with uh, an, a locally advanced disease, they may just have symptoms of urinary problems. Difficulty with passing urine, you know, waking up many times at night to pass urine, hematuria, which means blood in their urine. If anybody has blood in his urine, please let him see his doctor. If possible, let him see the urologist because they may be a harbinger, you know, for you know prostate cancer. Also, they can have sperm, you know, uh, blood in their sperm, in their semen when they ejaculate. They might have some pain in the perineum. All right. For patients who the cancer has affected or spread to affect the ureteric orifices, these are the tubes where urine drains from. They can have renal failure because urine is not, no longer going to be coming out. It stays back in the kidneys and damages the kidneys. Okay. So for those that the prostate cancer has spread to other parts of the body, they can have bone pains all over the body, a lot of weight loss. Their appetite is very poor. They can't eat, you know, and um, as I mentioned, you know, breathlessness when it has spread to the lungs, when they are spread to the liver, they can be jaundiced and many things. Um, this reminds me of a study um, that myself and my boss carried out a couple of years ago. Uh, with, uh, it was called the unusual presentation of prostate cancer. And this was um, because we noticed that majority of our patients present with metastatic disease. So if you don't have a high index of suspicion and you're waiting for them to complain about difficulty with passing urine, they're already far beyond that. So as you can see on, in these images, you can see this huge supraclavicular lymph uh, mass here. This it was prostate cancer, which has spread, you know, to involve that area. And here you can see somebody's scalp, the nodule, a big nodule on the scalp. This was prostate cancer in advanced stage. Uh, we, this paper, I will show the reference at the end of, the of this research, uh, so you can read it up. These are very interesting uh, research that we've done. So um, how is prostate cancer staged? You can see the area which I've marked with the red, which is 
the early cancer, the localized cancer. This is what the urologist and what the oncologist wants to see. They want to, if you're going to have cancer, which we don't want, but let it be early. Let it be at a stage that you can be cured, that you can be helped, rather than when you know it's more advanced. So the TNM staging is uh, the staging system that we use in staging, you know, prostate cancer. So you can you can use you can look at this image here. I'm just trying to show what it looks like when we see the TNM staging. This is the T staging. So you can see the T1 stage where you can have a little lesion in the prostate gland, the T2, and then the T3 when it's already getting to the capsule of the prostate. And of course, T4 when it has gone beyond the prostate, you know, capsule of the prostate. So when this happens, what do we do? We want to investigate the patients. All right. So um, we keep on mentioning the PSA, PSA, PSA. PSA stands for prostate specific antigen. This is a tumor marker. It's a, it, we call it a, a human calicrine. It's a, it's a, it's a tumor marker. It's a you know, chemical that flows in the blood, which um, the discovery of this, of this uh, PSA has went so long in helping us make diagnosis. It's something we can check in the blood of a patient. The normal value should be between zero and four nanograms per mil. The higher the PSA value above four nanograms per mil, the higher the chance of having prostate cancer. So it's something we can use to screen in the population. We can go in the community and do their PSA values. Those that you have abnormal readings more than four should see the urologist so that you can actually check these guys out and identify which and which of them may have prostate cancer. So the PSA is so important and so crucial uh, in diagnosing prostate cancer. And it also tells us you know, about how we manage, you know, especially for, for the, the physicians. Also the full blood count whereas the FBC, you know, want to check the blood levels Make sure they are not too low. If they are low, patient may require blood transfusions. Uh, the, the EIU creatinine, that's what that means. Uh, that's a renal function. We want to check the kidney function and ensure that the kidney is working properly. We want to look at the urine, ensure there are no infections in the urine. We want to do an ultrasound scan, uh, looking at the prostate gland you know, and all the contiguous structures. This can be a pointer uh, that there are abnormalities there that may suggest cancer. Usually when we see hypoechoic lesions in the prostate gland, it suggests to us that there may be cancer there in about 70% of patients. Um, when we see all this, uh, we want to do superior imagings to help us stage the disease. Um, the images that we uh, more commonly do is the pelvic MRI. The pelvic MRI, MRI is magnetic res resonance imaging. It helps us to appropriately characterize the lesion in the prostate, the size. How far has it gone? What of the local lymph nodes that drain the prostate? Do they look suspicious of cancer? And you look at the entire body from the chest, you know, the long bones, you doing a radionuclide, a bone scintigraphy, we want to look around. So we can identify a lesion in the prostate, we want to check has it spread to other parts of the body. That's exactly what we do. Um, and after looking at those things, to confirm the diagnosis, we do an image guided biopsy, the last thing on that page. The only way to say somebody has cancer of the prostate is through a biopsy. You have to take tissues from that person. So we do this usually from the anus. We put a little needle there under anesthesia and take some tissues from the suspicious areas under image guidance. And when we take it, we send to the laboratory uh, and it confirms whether there is cancer you know, in the prostate or not. And this also goes a long way in telling us what to do. So how do we treat? How we treat the patients are determined by several factors. Number one, the stage. I mentioned the TNM staging already. So when the TNM staging is confirmed, uh, it tells us what to do. Early disease, you, you are thinking that you can cure such a patient. Advanced disease, you are thinking, oh, I can't cure this anymore, but I'm going to palliate. Palliation means we're going to keep him comfortable. We're going to stop the disease from progressing and keep him alive and comfortable as long as possible. All right? So the, also the age of the patient. For patients who are very elderly, what it suggests is that they may not have a very long life expectancy. For somebody who does not have up to a 15 year life expectancy, then you also must be very careful and not offer them anything too radical, anything too traumatizing, like major surgeries and major radiotherapies, because this could actually worsen their quality of life and actually cause their own death. So you have to weigh all these things. Um, also the comorbidities, are there issues, hypertension, diabetes, you know, uh, Parkinson's disease, are there, are there other health hazards this patient has, which make him not likely to survive long. You don't want to inflict too much you know, um, problems on such patients. Um, and what we call the performance status, how strong is he? Can he walk? Can he carry out activities? Or is he a bedridden patient? You will be sued if you go to do such a radical kind of operation on somebody who is bedridden, who can't walk. 
who is sick. You know, so these are the things that affect. Also, the patient's choice. Sometimes you have to leave the choices to the patient. Sir, we can offer you radiotherapy or we can offer you surgery. These are the complications. Are they things you can live with or not? For instance, for advanced disease, uh, metastatic disease, we do androgen deprivation. What we call, we, we try to reduce the amount of um, uh, androgens, testosterone in their body. Sometimes surgically in the rural areas, they, can, they might need to cut off the testes, remove the balls of such a patient. Some men would rather die than have you remove their balls. So you have to be very clear about your plan and, and get a response from the patient and his family. Is this something that they are comfortable with going ahead with? And finally, the medical facilities and the skills of the staff in the area. In many parts of the country, you do not have medical facilities for radiotherapy, for radionuclide bone scan. You don't have urologists or oncologists. You don't have people that can treat. So this will also affect the way some of these patients are treated in such areas. All right, so, um, so I just as classified this into two for the early organ confined disease and for the advanced you know, metastatic disease, just to make it simple for our non-medics in the house. So for early disease, um, we can go conservatively. These are usually for elderly patients. You don't want to do anything too radical. You want to keep on monitoring them and to ensure the disease is not progressing. All right, so this, we do this through active surveillance or watchful waiting. For those that are younger and fitter, then you can offer them radical uh, prostatectomy, which is a major operation where we remove the entire prostate gland, all right, or radical radiotherapy. This is, we don't need to, in this case, this is done by the oncologist. What, the, what is done here is that radiation is, you know, uh, uh, is, is given to the patient on the area of the prostate with the aim of killing all the cancer cells. So these two are the gold standard worldwide for managing early you know, prostate cancer with good you know, satisfactory outcome. If patients are picked early, they can be cured. That is absolutely true. There are also other modalities which are not as common, which are still being tried, like cryoablation, high intensity uh, frequency ultrasound, radiofrequency interstitial tumor ablation. These are still on the experimental stages. They are being done in some Western countries, but the gold standard of treatment you know, is the radical prostatectomy or radical radiotherapy. Hormonal ablation, I left it at last because in some of the developing countries, they don't even have any of these options. So despite whatever stage they present, they want to do you know, androgen deprivation. So this is why I left it as the last option there. What of for the advanced disease? Our treatment here is usually palliative, as I mentioned. We are here to keep this patient comfortable, pain-free, prevent the disease from advancing you know, by slowing it down and keeping them alive for as long as possible. We are not going to cure. We're not going to touch the prostate. We're not going to cure this disease, you know? So the gold standard here is what we call androgen deprivation therapy. So these uh, are modalities that we use in reducing the circulating blood testosterone, as I said earlier. So this can be done medically using drugs or it can be done surgically. So there are drugs that can be given that reduce the blood testosterone levels. It's almost like castrating this person. So um, when this happens, the prostate cancer you know, because prostate cancer thrives on testosterone, this slows down the cancer and makes the patient feel a lot better and live, you know, longer. Um, this can also be done surgically by cutting off the testes. It's a minor surgery, but not something any man would like to hear. But this is what we, a lot of, uh, of centers in Nigeria offer this to the patients. Um, there are several types of agents that have been tried, you know, and there's also... Um, an entity of castrate resistant prostate cancer, but I will not bore this, uh, this audience with that. So when we are managing patients with metastatic disease, you have to realize that disease, the cancer has spread. So there, is, there, are, there are other modalities that you may have to embrace in this management, like radiotherapy. You may have to radiate the prostate, you may have to radiate the bones, if it has significant bone pains and things like that, the spine. You may have to give chemotherapy for those that have failed you know, several lines of drugs. You may have to do a channeling TUR, uh, you know, remove part of the prostate. For those that cannot urinate, you have to use a minor surgery to remove part of the prostate so they can pee freely and, and be happy. You know, you may need to give copious analgesics like opioids so that they are free from pain. You may need to give drugs like bisphosphonates to, you know, prevent their skeleton from fracturing, things like steroids and many others that we do to palliate them. Now we come to prevention, which is the meat of the presentation. Can breast cancer be, pre breast cancer be prevented? The answer is yes. Well, this yes is a funny yes, because as I mentioned earlier, we don't really know the cause of prostate cancer. What we know is that being a man, having the testes is a risk factor for having prostate cancer. 
So um, for every other man, you know, there are things from the risk factors that we know, there are things that we have seen through studies that can, you know, prevent prostate cancer. So I would like to tackle it at the primary level, secondary level, and at the tertiary level. So primary prevention, this is preventing the disease from coming in the first place. So um, reduction in animal fat in our diet, increase the vegetables, the fruits, and the legumes in your diet. This goes a long way in preventing you from developing prostate cancer. Also, trace elements like selenium, zinc, lycopene should be you know, got in our diet. You can supplement, use those supplements. They help us in, in, to fight you know, having disease like prostate cancer. Studies have shown this. You know, um, and then obesity, you know, is to be fought and avoided at all costs. It has been found that men with body mass in this greater than 35 kilogram per meter squared have a higher incidence of having prostate cancer. So this is why you must go to the gym, you must exercise, you must be fit. So I've mentioned here, exercise, very, very important. The more you exercise and keep fit, the lower the chances of having prostate cancer. Also, avoiding cigarette smoking in any form, shisha, uh, you know, marijuana, and all those smoke, they've been found to increase risk of prostate cancer. Limit alcohol ingestion. As I mentioned, um, study by um, uh, Ryder et al., um, which surveyed about 30,000 American men, found that men you know, who ejaculated in the excess of 21 times per month had a lower risk of developing prostate cancer compared to men who ejaculated less than four times per month. OK, so this is not saying you should ejaculate as everywhere you find it, but this was a, what a study showed. And you know, in a large population of patients, this is why we can't ignore this study. Even though um, Jimmy Stropolo in Greece found that it wasn't particularly true in a very few, in fewer percentage of men, he found out that men who ha were more sexually active at the older age of greater than 40 were actually you know, less uh, at risk of prostate cancer, but those who were having a lot of sex at the young age, 21 to 30, uh, perhaps because of recurrent STIs, actually develop prostate cancer a lot earlier. So, you know, these are still controversial, but, you know, things that we should bring to your notice so that we can ask questions, we can do more research to know exactly, you know, um, what it is, because prostate cancer is a disease that we should, you know, be concerned about. What of chemo prevention? Studies also showed that in a population, when they took Five hyper hydrotase inhibitors. These are drugs we use for benign prostatic enlargement. What they do is that they inhibit conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, which is the active form. So when they give this, give this drug to the population, it was realized that those that had the drug for some time, you know, uh, had reduced chance of having prostate cancer. So some people thought perhaps it could be a way around, but it was found that those that now develop prostate cancer among them had more severe forms of prostate cancer. So this is why you see that nobody will routinely give such drugs to people in, in, the, in, you know, in an environment or in the community. Secondary prevention. This means you know, reducing the burden of the disease through population screening and identifying preclinical conditions. So this means that there is a rule for advocacy going to the community, giving health talks for them to know what prostate cancer is, screening them so that those that you may find early, you get them in and give them the treatment they deserve. This is also part of prevention. Most people don't know. They think it's just primary prevention. So secondary prevention is a thing. So there is a role for health advocacy, for community screening, for identifying pre-malignant lesions like high-grade prost uh, prostatic intraepithelial neoplasia. These are things that you can find. And then you follow the patients up to ensure that they do not you know, go progress to the disease. So this is where, you know, uh, I'll talk about my, uh, in my recommendations, I'll speak further. What of tertiary prevention? This focuses on halting the disease progression and recurrence in patients with the disease. So when a patient has the disease already, it's important that the disease is managed appropriately, that is halted, the progression is halted, you know, so that the recurrence is stopped. So this also tells us that there's a need for health facilities for you know, um, centers with capacity for radiotherapy, for surgery, for skills, you know, uh, physicians, you know, oncologists, uh, nurses, advocacy specialists like RONC and non-governmental organizations, there is a need for these people. Everybody needs to be there, identify these patients, send them to the right facilities to get the desired treatment so that they do not progress with the disease or die from the disease. This is also part of prevention. This is tertiary prevention. So there's definitely a need for financial support, some form of insurance. You know, usually this is from the government, and then uh, a robust follow-up. You know, uh, you know, to follow up patients, and for those that are having issues, they come back and we follow them up. So this brings me to advocacy. In 2018, uh, I met this young man, uh, Ron Sichidebe, in Malaysia on our way. You know, for the uh, 
World Cancer Congress, where we both went as an advocate for prostate cancer. On the right side, on the right side there, you see me having presented uh, my work on uh, prostate cancer uh, screening, checking the knowledge among uh, about 500 men in the community. And this is what we must all do. We must all go out of our comfort zones to, uh, to influence things. We must go out to educate men using our social media platforms, using the TV, the radio, involve the government officials to let us get the message out there. Prostate cancer is real. The men must be identified and they must be treated. And better still, the, the health, you know, things they need to do to prevent the cancer in the first place. These are things, if we do not talk, nobody's going to hear us. All right, so here uh, I was giving a talk uh, on having had um, uh, I spent, uh, the, I, I got the African Cancer Fellowship Award, so I was uh, sent to a neighboring country, Senegal, which has a better prostate cancer, you know, uh, you know, um, advocacy, screening, and treatment protocol. So I was able to study them, and I saw that there's so much difference. So you can see, um, to put this in context, uh, this is the study that we that we did, prostate cancer, prostate cancer screening, knowledge and attitude among the semi urban population of Nigerian men. And our findings were, you know, were, were, were funny more than close to 90 percent of the men that we studied didn't know the role of of the psa in diagnosing prostate cancer we found out that just about 13 percent of men you know uh elderly men had ever gone to have their psa checks so this means we must educate the young men they must know before they get to those age groups what they need to do to prevent the disease to check themselves up this is exactly what we are talking about so in conclusion Prostate cancer is a, is a disease of public health importance in Nigeria. A lot has to be done to improve community awareness. Majority of you know, Nigerian patients present with advanced disease and die from this disease. We must lay emphasis on the several steps of prevention of this disease. How do we do this? As medical community, as non-governmental organizations like Ronsi's group and every other group, we must continue to raise awareness on prostate cancer. Yes, breast, cervical, yes, but prostate cancer is there. That is what the men you know, suffer. So we must emphasize on disease prevention and tell them what they need to do to prevent the disease. We must also engage the government. There has to be political will because um, government is made up of a lot of men. You know, um, Most of the men go to, abroad to get their care, but what of the men in Nigeria? So they have to encourage community-based screening, finance these things, invest in resource, you know, uh, resources in training staff, in building facilities that have, the, you know, uh, that have what it takes to manage prostate cancer. For instance, radiotherapy. If you say radiotherapy in Nigeria, you can only think about two or three centers. And each time you call their, their, their radiotherapy machine is down. You can't do a radioisotope bone scan to be able to stay disease appropriately. So a lot of times you are managing patients blindly without having all the facilities. The government has to come in. This is not what you expect the private sector to take up, to provide some of these facilities and then subsidize treatments. Our patients pay out of pocket. If you're gonna pay out of pocket for treatment, many of them can't afford anything. So you need to subsidize the treatment by the health insurance scheme or what have you, so that patients can come and be followed up appropriately. Here are some of the references uh, that I you know, went through uh, while preparing this presentation. I hope it's been worth your while. I'll be very happy to uh, engage in any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope you can all hear me. I can hear you yes, perfectly. Clearly. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Igupu Martin C for that packed uh, presentation. Uh, there were so many takeaways and the questions have started coming in. Uh, just, I, I, I wouldn't attempt to summarize your presentation, just to highlight a few points. And uh, I think the bottom line and that's the reason why you are here. You answer the question, is prostate cancer preventable? It's preventable and it's uh, cheering news and it's good to uh, know. Just a quick outline, maybe for those who are just joining us, uh, Dr. Ugoquin Martin C, who's our guest speaker today, is a consultant, urologist, renal transplant surgeon at Zenith Medical Kidney Center in Abuja and he spoke on the topic, is prostate cancer uh, presentable, uh, preventable, sorry about that. Uh, so we know from his presentation that prostate cancer is cancer affecting the prostate gland in men 
Uh, he said uh, it's the fourth most commonly diagnosed cancer and the third leading cancer death in Nigeria. And the peak age is between 60 to 79 years. We are all gradually inching uh, towards that. I'll throw the floor open now for questions. I think the way we'll go is uh, people can raise their hands or send uh, questions in the chat room. Maybe we take two, three questions, he responds then, so that that way we can collate uh, other questions as we go along. Uh, there is a question uh, somebody dropped earlier while you were speaking. Maybe you take that first or you note that while we'll see if there are other questions. And if there are questions, I would like to, those who have made this possible today, I'm talking about that uh, will be Prince Ademolu AA and his uh, organization, the Jehovah Devil Student Association uh, O2 Club. If he has any question now, first I'll give him the right of first diffusal, as the politicians say. And uh, so the, the question I have here is talking about, just let me, I try to put it in a system. Is there a cor any correlation between having multiple female sex partners and prostate cancer? Then there is a second question. It's not very clear to me. I'm trying to rewrite it, but I'll just read it the way it is. Secondly, should a man not, not in capital letters, be sexually active, despite the fact the man is married, is such a man at risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer? Then let me so, go back. Can I, can I take the two together? Yes, you can answer that, this first set of questions. Why we look for, why we go oh, Yeah, so, so um, correlation between sexual intercourse um, and prostate cancer. So as I said, um, studies, uh, like the study from Jennifer Ryder, which um, actually found that men who had more sex in the excess that ejaculated in the excess of 21 times per month, we had a lower risk of developing prostate cancer. So definitely th there seems to be some form of protective mechanism, you know, uh, that ejaculation causes, you know. Um, there's a, there's, there, there have been postulations to these regards, which I've, sort of, you know, I've researched several. And what, what is believed is that the more a man ejaculates, he relieves the prostate gland you know, of the prostatic fluid there. It, is not, it doesn't remain static. So usually some of the carcinogens, these are chemical comp compounds that may contain cancer, things that can cause cancer. You know, we eat a lot of junk food and things. So usually the, if a man ejaculates often and relieves the prostate of you know, the prostatic fluid, then those carcinogens don't have a long time to perpetrate their effect and cause inflammation on the prostate gland. These are, you know, hypothetical, you know. Uh, I also mentioned that uh, there is also, uh, there are also studies that have suggested that recurrent sexually transmitted infections cause recurrent inflammation of the prostate that can lead to cancer. So, but having sex doesn't necessarily mean you have to have STIs. So if you're, you know, uh, you know, having, you know, have a, your partner who is your wife, and protected intercourse, you know, and all that, then that should be, that, that should be fine. So, but this is uh, what I can say as regards what research has said on this topic. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next question, uh, it's an alarm bell, more or less. Ellis, Ellis, I think the person is uh, referencing your presentation. Just that I think what we might need here is more of clarification. Early sex prostate cancer could lead to early sex prostate could lead to prostate cancer. Why little or uh, few sex can also lead to prostate. Men are really in big trouble. Uh, I think the, yeah, you spoke about that. Maybe you provide some clarification. Yeah, yeah, it's um, yeah, some, while some studies were trying to refute the claim that uh, more sex is protective, so some also tried to talk about that. But what I would say is that um, this, what I what I meant is not that um, having sex at a young age increases the risks. No, 
what I what I'm, I was trying to say is that you know um, what that was linked to was the el earlier sex what may be linked to recurrent sexually transmitted infections. So, but as I said, you know, you, you, you don't routinely got, get sexually transmitted infections. So this is something you can protect yourself against. So um, with all due respect, I think you should have sex. Yes. All right, thanks for the clarification. Then there is a question about age. At what, what age range can uh, someone go for PSA screening? Then, okay, uh, so this is quite controversial, but they, um, but we agree that um, from 50 years of age, um, is acceptable that every man should have his PSA check yearly from 50 years of age. For those men who have high risk of prostate cancer, these are men, men, you know, uh, who have, you know, someone that has died from prostate cancer, like uh, a first degree relative, three or more first degree relatives who have had three generations of their family you know, having prostate cancer, you know, and or who have had a family member having prostate cancer at the age of less than 55 years, such men should begin by 40 or 45 years old to have their annual PSA checks. Okay, uh, let me ask this question. Now that you mentioned uh, people who have some history, uh, family history of uh, cancer or uh, prostate cancer, perhaps, what, what are the odds that if your father had prostate cancer uh, that the son, let's say he has three or four sons, what are the odds that any of these sons would have prostate cancer? So um, for, it, for, for us to say that is hereditary prostate cancer um, is not just uh, one family member, usually it's three. Uh, is, is like a rule of three. Three family members would have had a history of prostate cancer before we see it in someone. We say, oh, this is hereditary. Number two, three generations, like a grandfather, father, and son, having prostate cancer in three generations. And lastly, if you have, you know, one, fish, one person in the family having it aged less than 55 years. So this now Begun to the group of hereditary prostate cancer. And this accounts for about 5 to 10% of prostate cancer. It's not very common. Most of prostate cancer that we see are sporadic. This means that there's no identifiable risk factor. Do you understand? So there's no identifiable risk factor. So, but if an individual's parents or father has prostate cancer, definitely studies have shown that he has about 1.5 to 2 times the risk compared to the general population. So this is why such a person, you must be, you know, up to date. You must be aware and, you know, be close to your urologist, start your PSA checks at the right time, just, just to be on the safe side. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have it, but you're at a higher risk than the general population. Okay, just quickly again, Nishan. So is there like a terminal age, for want of a better word, like if you cross this threshold, say 80 or 85, there isn't then the possibility of, uh, and you don't have it, you are not likely to. Is there anything like that? No, sir. As I mentioned earlier, let me give you the context. Prostate cancer is a disease of age, all right? If you check 80 men, or rather, if you check 100 men who are 80 years of age, about 80% of them are likely to have prostate cancer. If you check on 100 men who are 90 years of age, about 90% of them are like have. So the older you are, the higher the chances you're gonna have prostate cancer. However, the older you are, when you develop the disease, the more benign it is, the more we are not worried about it, the more you are likely to die with the disease rather than off the disease. You know, I have a grandfather who has had prostate cancer for more than 20 years. He's 105. He just walks around and all that. So the older you are, diagnosis. And um, why is that so? that is the biology of the tumor it's uh, it's usually a more you know uh, because it's a disease of age the older you are the chances that you have cancer is more but usually not an aggressive type is a, a degenerative it just has occurred with age so this is why we select what you do for them you can't grab a 100 year old man and start subjecting him to various type of surgical procedures when you know that it's not likely to be anyway trouble him do you understand what i mean sir so this is yeah. the context the older you are the higher the chances that you're going to have it but that doesn't worry the specialist because we know that the older you are the higher the chances that you're not going to be die from prostate cancer thank you uh we have a question from a lady and it says i'm a breast cancer survivor i want to know if my two sons are at risk of prostate cancer and if yes what can i start doing now to support them 
uh, for my daughter, I have vaccinated her against HPV. Very fantastic question. So um, your sons don't have a high risk of prostate cancer. However, I must mention, if the breast cancer you have is as a result of a genetic you know, abnormality, especially what we, call, what we call the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 genes, if you have mutation in those genes, if that is the etiology of the breast cancer, this accounts for about five to 10% of breast cancer, then that similar genetic is also been found to be a cause of uh, you know prostate cancer is a risk is a genetic predisposition to prostate cancer so but i'm very sure that because majority of our women 90 percent of them also come with sporadic breast cancer is not related to genetics it's not related to anything so the chances that your sons may have prostate cancer is very slim but you know in our in our country we do not do molecular studies into the etiology of disease so it's very unlikely that they've we've gone as deep as identifying the tumor biology of, her, of the breast cancer, is it related to the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene you know, uh, uh, mutations? So this is why you know, one cannot say it you know, uh, as strongly, but you, know, just this, you have a small percentage risk for them having prostate cancer. So as I said, uh, by the time the boys are about 50 years of age, which is a long time, because the way you mentioned they are young boys, they should you know, inculcate safe, best uh, health practices, or rather, as soon as they are young men, you know, let them have this, as we said, you know, a lot of fruits and vegetables in their diet, just teach them the healthy way of life and you'll never be wrong. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Uh, the next question says, now that age is a major factor, are there any supplements you can recommend for proper prevention of prostate, uh, prostate cancer in later age? Um, well, yes, I, I, you know, if, if one uh, eats foods rich in um, some of the trace elements I mentioned, apart from the fruits, you know, vegetables, legumes, you know, we talked about lycopene. Lycopene is um, uh, present in, in tomatoes. This is something that is very protective against prostate cancer. Talked about selenium, zinc, you know, um, vitamin C, you know, and vitamin D. These are you know, supplements that are very healthy, you know, uh, and protective against prostate cancer. So if you can inculcate these in your diet, this go a long way. You know, even though studies uh, have not been very clear, there's a trial, we call the SELECT trial, uh, which was carried out in Netherlands, uh, over 40, close to 40,000 men were given supplements of selenium and vitamin E, uh, and they didn't really find much of a difference. However, some part of that study found that, you know, Perhaps you know the risk of prostate cancer may be slightly reduced when men you know uh, have more of these trace elements in their diet. So I think it's, it's safe to have you know some supplementation of trace elements like selenium, you know zinc, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E in diet. Okay, we we'll move on to the next question. Somebody is asked: Can HPV in men, which causes penile cancer, also enhance the growth? of prostate cancer and then what if there are no symptoms of the former in a man does it doesn't make it a, a risk of the latter what if there are no symptoms of the former in a man i guess what they are trying to say does it make it a risk of the latter I'm not sure if you got the question yeah yeah um so that hp hpv yeah, so I, I know I've come across one or two studies on that, but this is not a, a common uh, a common etiological factor for prostate cancer. HPV, which causes penile cancer, I totally understand what you mean, which can be contracted uh, from women, it's because this, this is a major cause of cervical cancer. So it's not been uh, found as a major risk factor for prostate cancer. So I think you're, you're safe. Do we have any more questions? We still have about... Uh maybe two, three minutes if there are any questions. Yes, doctor, um, can I speak? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you, doctor. Um, I want to ask, you know, in our local palace here, people always look for local ways to treat ailments. Has there been any research as regards um, maybe our herbs, our local content, reducing the risk of the cancer? And um, two, would one go through um, radiation like um, therapy, the radiotherapy kind of uh, solution to cancer? Because I know cancer 
has to will be treated by radiation. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Prince uh, Dumulu, for your question. Doc, before you respond, maybe now that uh, he's raised the issue of local content, there are so many things people talk about. This uh, is it breadfruit. Uh, there are so many things. Maybe tell us what you know uh, so that we just stick to that because there are so many things we don't know which people are recommending. And I'm not talking about the roadside health sellers. I'm talking about people telling you, blend these fruits, save it, drink it. It's, it's uh, what do we know? Thank you. To be honest, sir, I don't have a clue because, you know, <laughs> the more you read or the more you see these things, the more confused you are. So there are all sorts of, you know, um, articles everywhere concerning, um, you know, fruits, and you know natural occurring substances that can be protective. What I can say is that, um, of course, we're not talking about abo, Mr. Uh, Prince Tukumbo, not abo, because men, the way they are drinking abo these days, abo is not what we are, we are talking about. <laughs> the natural products like sour sap, you know, garlic, celery, and things like that, which is what people are doing. Onions, you see people drinking onion juice, and you know. So what I would say is that. The, ideally, the way God has created things, if you eat a healthy amount of, you know, uh, the healthy stuff in your diet, a lot of fruits, vegetables, salads, uh, rather than all the chicken and the beef, pork, all the things we like to eat more of, then you're likely to um, be safe from this disease. So what I, my own advice personally and what I practice is go out of your way to get the extra vegetables, to get the extra fruits in your diet, you know, sour sap, you know, the purpose, all those, let that be uh, a major staple in your home, you know, and uh, cut down on the, you know, industrialized stuff, the chicken and the beefs and all that as much as possible. This is my advice. So I'm not going to say grind onions, eat ogo, that's it. So this is it. This is my submission. And as, as regards the supplements, you will find that if you stick to a diet rich in fruits and vegetables, you're going to also be able to avoid deficiency of some of the trace elements we mentioned, like selenium and zinc and vitamin E and vitamin C, because they are so rich in the vegetables and the fruits. So this is my submission. I didn't get clearly what you meant about radiation. I didn't get the question. Um, thank you. I mean about um, you know cancer. Most cancer-related ailments is treated by chemotherapy, and it's, um, chemotherapy is also could be tend to be um, through um, RV rays, ray light also, which also leads to radiation in the skin and the body cells. That's what I meant by radiation, the chemotherapy type of treatments. Okay, so you are talking about radiotherapy. So is, what are you saying? That is a, a, an option of treatment for prostate cancer. So what do you want to know about that? It's an option of treatment for prostate cancer. And yes, if, if I understand, is it that he's asking to see whether radiation itself can then cause, if one is exposed to uh, radioactive uh, conditions, let's say you do x-rays a lot and things like yes, that. Yes, yes, thank you. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, um, the 95% of prostate cancer, the histology is what we call adenocarcinoma. Um, adenocarcinomas are not caused uh, by radiation and things like that, x-rays. It's not, a, it's not known to be a cause of uh, prostatic adenocarcinoma, no. So it's not, uh, it's not having x-rays or something that is not known. That is more linked to skin cancers, you know, blood cancers and things like that, rather than prostate cancer. Okay, thank you so much. I think we'll leave it at there, but before you go, doctor, just one last question. Uh, somebody is thrown this out to ask if how obesity, can you explain how obesity is a risk factor in prostate cancer? And if you answer that question, just to wrap up, give us a 30 second soundbite for laymen, what we need to do to, to survive prostate cancer to be on the safe side. Thank you. All right, sir. Um, so um, obesity, yes. So in, in obese patients, um, 
there are several things. One, there is a, a very huge concentration of adipose tissue. This is fatty tissue. They have a high density of adipose tissue. We know that adipose tissue on its own can secrete testosterone. So apart from the testosterone from the testes, they also have another extra site of testosterone production from the adipose tissue. Adipose tissue, the fatty tissue, also produces estrogen, which is the female hormone. This is why you see uh, men that are fat, you know, having a lot of breasts and things like that. You know, the body type now looks more feminine. So um, these, among others, um, are you know extra testicular sites uh, and hormonal uh, interplay can increase the risk of them developing prostate cancer, as um, as studies have shown. Uh, as I mentioned. When a man's BMI is more than BMI's body mass index, greater than 35 kilograms per meter square, they've been found to have a higher incidence you know, of prostate cancer. So the idea is to cut down the amount of fat tissue, adipose tissue on the body, you know, uh, as much as possible. Okay. The sound bite. So here it goes. Um, prostate cancer is the leading cause of uh, cancer-related deaths in Nigeria men. It's a huge, you know, burden to uh, Nigerian men and also uh, African American men, as well as men of African descent, all over the world. In our environment, sadly, majority of the men present with advanced or metastatic disease very late. At which time, the doctor's hands are tied and we can't do much. Therefore, majority of the men who present with prostate cancer die from disease in Nigeria. This is different from what we see overseas. So the idea is one for us to prevent prostate cancer from developing by living a healthy life, eating a lot of fruits, vegetables, legumes in our diet, cutting down on carbs, on animal proteins and dairy products, by exercising, by cutting down our weight, obesity is bad, cutting out cigarette smoking, alcohol ingestion and other things, by having sex frequently. Um, and also, we also have to have a good habit, a good health seeking habit advisably from 50 years of age, every man should consult their urologist to have their annual screening check done by having their PSA checks, rectal examination and ultrasound done yearly so that paraventure they have this disease is picked up early at a time that they can be cured. Also, finally, our voices, all our voices are needed to be lent to this discourse. We should talk at our workplace. We should let them know about prostate cancer. They should make research. People should know that there's a disease like this. And the more we talk about this, more likely we are going to be able to have better outcome from this disease in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much, doctor. Before you go, you mentioned alcohol and the drinkers among us are concerned, some of us who enjoy our alcohol. Uh, alcohol is a risk factor in prostate cancer. Somebody threw this question and I just thought we should answer it. It says, please, how many bottles of beer or glass of wine would you recommend? Sir, we are, we, are, we are together. We are together, sir. It's not only you, we are together. So, um, <laughs> so uh, I think the, the idea is, um, is moderation, is moderation. So um, what we normally advise is um, for every man is to have less than two units of alcohol per day, less than two units of alcohol. So um, a unit of alcohol um, is, or some say less than you know, 60 grams of alcohol per day. So it may be difficult for the layman to calculate what all this mean. But what this means is uh, you don't want to have more than two glasses of wine per day, you know, or you know, uh, two beer, beer mugs of beer per day, a shot of whiskey per day, and things like that. That is the way it's measured. Um, so, but as I, but this is what the what is written in the books. But I will say, you know, everything is sense. You have to be, you know, think for yourself, you know, and uh, avoid things. So. Wine, of course, red wine and white wine and things like that are actually a lot safer than beer, which has a lot of you know things that can cause erectile issues, and gin, which can cause a lot of damage to the liver. So I really recommend for my clients wine twice in a week, and that's good enough. You know, of course, this is I, I'm not an authority, but, but it's just thinking that you don't want to push your body to the limit. You don't want to wait and see what happens. We can start now to live healthy, and then and that's it. Thank you so much, uh, Doctor, and I would hope to consult you when next time in Nigeria, just to generally discuss about this very important topic. Uh, 
we are almost running off the program. We have about eight minutes more. I hope we can fit the three remaining items on the agenda in the next eight minutes. The next item on the agenda is appreciation. And that will be done by Mr. Obadin of Luayomi, who is the treasurer of Ijebode Old Boys Association, Ijebode Grammar School Old Boys Association O2 Club. If Mr. Badina is with us, please, sir, you have two minutes to give us, uh, I think there should be the vote of thanks. Sir. Do we have Mr. Badina? Um, sorry about that. I think most of them used my link, so they were all um, appearing as my name on the link, so the admin removed uh, them. So while trying to connect back, I think Obadino was among those who- okay, those who couldn't. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. So let me just quickly round it up so we don't get Please. to delay, delay the program. Um, on behalf of Jebode Grammar School to Club, I want to say a big thank you, thank you, thank you to Dr. Martin Igbukwe and to Dr. Chido Onuma, it will be it will be inappropriate if I don't get the name right. <laughs> you are right, Onuma. <laughs> and um, I also also I also I also want to say a big thank you to the executive director of Project Pink Blue, in person of Mr. Rose Chidibe, and to the project supervisor, Madam I call her Madam Bawo Kadija, and to all the staff of Project Pink Blue who had made today a success. Even though our numbers was not so encouraging, I can um, tell you for a fact that uh, it's, we, we or, or I'll rather apologize and say uh, the next um, episode will be much, much, much larger. And that's a promise from our end. And to everyone who has participated, both the participants and everyone who has um, put up questions, we want to say a big thank you. And I'm sure this won't be the end of an enlightenment um, webinar or um, program for this big um, issue among the black race and the entire world. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you, Prince. And uh, we'd like to thank you and your colleagues and your association for, it's not every time you find uh, people interested in social issues like this, much less uh, health issue, health, is wealth, they say health is paramount in uh, many countries and I've lived in Canada for 20, over 20 years and I can attest to that in the US. It's about the largest industry here because I mean, it's only somebody who is alive who can function. So health is priority and in Nigeria, we do not prioritize our health for so many reasons because of the economy, because of lack of information, awareness, and so on. So we need to constantly have things like this. As you said, this is just a starting thing. It's something once we start, the information will spread. If the link at the end of this program is shared, people can share, then share it on YouTube or uh, Facebook and uh, other social media platforms. And that's why I particularly asked uh, Dr. Ibuque for that sound bite, and I hope that the organizers can make a one or two minute video uh, in his closing remark that can be shared instead of all these crazy, racy pictures or fake news we share on uh, WhatsApp particularly. These are the kind of things, news item or information materials that we need to, and I hope Bronsi and his team are listening there are sound bites. There are sound bites from this presentation, particularly the closing remarks by Dr. Ibukwe that we can cut into sh very short nuggets of one, two, or three minutes that we can share to everybody who participated in this program and then those, and we can then share it to our old student association on different WhatsApp program. Uh, thank you very much for participating. Uh, just to say a big uh, 
on behalf of Project Pink Blue and the organizers of this uh, thing. It's been uh, wonderful being part of this. I haven't slept. Uh, it's actually uh, 9 a.m. 9 a.m. here. I had uh, a 3 a.m. Zoom conference that I delivered a paper that lasted for uh, till two hours ago. I had to stay up to join this because of the importance of uh, uh, this topic. I enjoyed every bit of it. I hope you all did. So uh, the remaining few minutes we have, there is a group photograph with projects, the pink, blue cap and shirts. I don't know how that's going to happen. Then after that, there is a virtual meet and greet. So if people, I'll drop my phone number here, uh, my Nigerian WhatsApp number, you can reach me on that. Uh, I also drop my email here and if people want to do that also. So I'll quickly hand over to Ronsi then. Unfortunately, there is no item seven. Or, yeah, I don't know what's going to. <laughs> We will do that next time, sir. What Zoom is what Zoom is causing? Uh, they have <laughs> conveniently now removed that from, as they tell us that history has been removed from a uh, school curriculum. Curriculum, which of course is not correct, but it's like uh, Zoom has led to the removal of item seven in in the discussion. So yeah, thank you very much. I hand the mic back to Project Pink Blue and team if there are any closing final things to say or do, let us know. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Good evening, everyone, once again. Um, so we are just asking everyone to please and please turn on your camera. If you can turn on your camera, that would be very helpful. We want to take a group picture. If you have a blue T-shirt, wear it. If you don't have a blue t-shirt, if you have anything blue on your side, just try and put it around your neck or somewhere just to ensure that we all are looking blue, you know. And we're going to help us please turn on your camera so we can see you. If you don't have blue, anything blue on you, don't worry. We can manage, you know, how you look. But if you have, try to get it around you. If you don't, just try to get something blue around your neck. I will show you what I'm putting on. I intentionally just did it so that everyone will understand that we just want something blue on you. So you can see my blue stuff, right? So the reason is because prostate cancer is represented with blue color. So everyone that have joined us today in today's meeting, you know, in partnership with the Jabo de Grammar School. Um, so it's a, it's a Chelsea fan. <laughs> Sorry to cut you. Well, <laughs> That's an important remark. I don't, know, I don't know if we have Manchester here. Please go on. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> so, oh yeah, you can see Dr. Martin has actually picked up his blue, his blue bottle of water. <laughs> yeah. So I can see many people are struggling to get something blue around them. So please do that and then we can take the group picture. Ogunde, Ogunde is struggling to get something blue. Oh yeah! <laughs> Yeah, so um, if um, you can still turn on your camera, that would be very helpful. Puma, we can see Puma, Rashid, and she too, Gloria, yes. So if you can turn on your camera, we can do the group photograph. I will probably give a few more seconds. Yeah, Tokumba is here with his blue, I think that's an ivy or something. Yeah. And you can turn on your, I mean, you can turn on your voices. You can unmute yourself. This is the time to just kind of talk over each other. All right. I, I have a blue pillow. <laughs> <laughs> We're still waiting for more people to turn on their cameras so we can take the good picture. I join you, Ronsi. I have a blue shirt. Um, I can't see you. Where are you? Ah, you should see me. I'm there. There's <laughs> something wrong with my camera. I can see you. I can see you. I was just trying to pull your legs. Why will you say you can see me with my blue shirt? Yeah. Okay, so I'll take the pictures now. You all need to smile and something. You know, smile and do thumbs up. Smile. Go. Bye. Bye.
Hmm? Another picture. Can you all smile? You know, give me a thumbs up. Man up. Good. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. The picture is done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Doctor. We appreciate. Yeah, thank you very much.